uh, introduce this afternoon uh, Mark Waterman from the MPA class of uh, uh, 1987. Uh, Mark is here uh, for, among other things, to be a visiting uh, leadership and governance fellow for the next couple of days. And so this is a program we have here at the Wilson School to uh, introduce our students and faculty to uh, distinguished uh, practitioners. Uh, and government uh, and government leaders. So those will be spending spent part of today and spent part of the next couple of days uh, meeting with students uh, and, and attending class. Uh, currently, uh, Mark is the senior advisor and director of the post-conflict reconstruction project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And today we'll be presenting a public lecture entitled "Toward a Smarter Multilateralism." Mark's. Uh, Focus at CSIS is on effective multilateral responses to global issues in areas that include defense and security, reconstruction and development, human rights, governance primarily in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, uh, Pakistan, South Asia, and Sub-Saharan Africa, so pretty much everywhere, so uh, uh, that's, that's good. Uh, but prior to joining CSIS, uh, Portman served at the United Nations in a number of capacities over 12 years. Most recently is the Chief of Staff to the UN Commission of Inquiry into the assassination of Prime Minister Bhutto of Pakistan. He's also served as the Chief of Staff to the UN Undersecretary General for Legal Affairs and Legal Counsel, among many other uh, uh, positions. Before joining the United Nations, Mark was a staff member of the Africa Subcommittee of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, and has served as a program officer at the Ford Foundation, and as an attorney at Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Warden, and Garrison. Uh, Corbin holds law degrees from Harvard Law School, a master's degree in public affairs from the Woodrow Wilson School, as I said, and a bachelor's degree uh, from the Yale University. At this point, let me uh, turn it over uh, to Mark uh, to talk about smart multilateralism. <laughs> Uh, no one, thank you very much for that, uh, for the introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to be back at the Woodrow Wilson School. Uh, uh, many fond memories here and, and seeing familiar faces uh, uh, and familiar places is, uh, is a wonderful thing. My, my wife, who is also uh, um, uh, a graduate of the Woodrow Wilson School, was, uh, was, was, was jealous that I was coming back, especially on such a nice day, and was uh, Upset. Uh, she works for the State Department. And was upset that uh, there wasn't a government shutdown so that she could come <laughs> along with me. Um, uh, I'd like to start with an apology. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. I remember when I was a student on these beautiful days. As you're coming to the end of the semester, it's so hard to drag yourself back inside. So all of you who've come, I uh, I appreciate it and I apologize for taking you out of uh, beautiful weather to talk about uh, smart multilateralism. Um, uh, in part because it's it's one of the sub um, heads of our of our program, and um, and I'm finding that it's a lot easier to uh, to figure out the. I, I've been at at the the Center for Strategic and International Studies for about six months now, and I'm finding that it's a lot easier to figure out the problems than to come up with the solutions on how we can do multilateralism smarter. So maybe you can have me back in about uh, six eight months to a year, ten years, to uh, <laughs> w once I've figured it out. Um, also, before I start, I, I think, Nolan, you, you introduced me as the director of the uh, uh, Project on Post-Conflict Reconstruction, if, if I'm not mistaken. And our um, uh, program title has, has changed, and we didn't inform you of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I was hired, and, and this is, this is uh, kind of relevant to the, to the point that I'll be talking about. I was hired um, uh, uh, by CSIS in part well, to, to lead the, the Project on Post-Conflict Reconstruction, but uh, uh, to, to think about how to reconfigure the program and, and, um, and move it into the future. It was a program that had served uh, CSIS very well over 10 years and it helped to um, pioneer um, activities in the area of post-conflict reconstruction. And 10 years later, among other things, we realized that nobody really calls it post-conflict reconstruction anymore, partly because we're doing <coughs> reconstruction or work in places where conflicts are still ongoing. Reconstruction kind of gives one the sense of um, building buildings. And when you think about certain places, like Afghanistan, for example, the question is, well, what are we really reconstructing there? Um, uh, uh, so the field now is, is, is variously called state building, peace building, among other things. But we wanted to 
think about how how to uh, uh, to expand beyond um, uh, uh, the the fairly narrow um, uh, uh, idea of the work of post-conflict uh, reconstruction, and we've renamed our program now the Program on Crisis, Conflict, and Cooperation. And because we have three names, of course, we have to have three pillars. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the first pillar, Crisis, uh, focuses largely on um, uh, uh, disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management, and we're and we're finding that in the, uh, uh, in the aftermath of floods in Pakistan, earthquakes in New Zealand and Japan, this is an area that's attracting quite a bit of interest. And we're uh, very interested in, especially in um, uh, the intersection of governance and uh, disaster risk reduction. Um, the second pillar, conflict, is largely focused on, once again, governance and conflict. And we're uh, producing, we'll be producing very soon a number of reports on local level governance in Afghanistan, um, uh, uh, and and ha how it interacts with the question and, and issues of conflict. And the third pillar, uh, the one closest to my heart, is uh, cooperation. I, I've come here, um, as Nolan said, after 12 years at uh, to CSIS, I should say, after 12 years at the United Nations, and um, wanted to work on multilateralism and uh, um, and think about ways to help multilateralism to be to be more effective. Um, and so uh, uh, while I have two very smart colleagues who are working on disaster risk reduction and governance and conflict, they've got me working on, um, on multilateralism, hence toward a smarter multilateralism. Um, uh, it's, 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 um, as, as Nolan said, I, I look at questions of multilateralism and how states can effectively address transnational issues that defy unilateral responses or bilateral solutions. Um, and one of the very positive things that I've, I've said uh, in a number of my conversations today is that um, working at a think tank, working at CSIS, gives me an opportunity to take a step back and consider multilateralism um, at a distance from my former day-to-day -day responsibilities. And, and also to do so in Washington, DC, which, which uh, is an interesting experience. We've just moved, our family has just moved there um, and have been there for six months. And um, it's, um, it's interesting. Working on multilateral issues in Washington doesn't necessarily give you an in with the popular kids in a town like Washington. Uh, I learned very quickly. Um, it's, uh, uh, I get reactions ranging from looks of incomprehension when I talk about multilateralism to mildly veiled pity um, at the arcane nature of my work to statements such as, good luck in this town. Um, but the leadership at, at CSIS, and I understood that introducing a multilateral oriented program at CSIS uh, would be an uphill challenge. Um, because for many policymakers, both Republicans and Democrats, multilateral diplomacy is a bit like taking your medicine. Um, it might be good for you, maybe it, it's, it might be necessary in some way, but it tastes bad. Um, and um, I got a sense of that, especially uh, in January when I testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, chaired by Ileana ross Layton on the United Nations. Um, it's, um, uh, one got the sense directly uh, what a whipping boy the United Nations can be uh, testifying before that committee. And the interesting thing is, um, you know, I, in, in my time on the hot seat, I found really very few friends, although some friends of the United Nations among Republicans, um, and very little real enthusiasm for the UN um, among the Democratic members of the committee, too. So. Um, uh, it was an interesting and um, an eye-opening uh, experience. Um, but times change. Mild interest in multilateralism has now turned into press demand and request for information on the inner workings of the Security Council because of Libya and to a much lesser extent Cote d'Ivoire. So I, I've had an uptick on discussions with policymakers on how the Security Council works or how multilateralism works in general some anchor buddy stints on CNN uh, describing uh, the workings of the UN, and a few more Twitter followers to my, uh, to my tweets on multilateralism and other issues. Of course, not nearly as many as Anne-Marie Slaughter. Um, <laughs> uh, old friend and my law professor, actually, who, who's played an important role in, um, in uh, reminding, outside of government, and clearly and forthrightly reminding us of our national responsibility to protect. 
uh, and how it relates to Libya. Um, I believe that Libya has presented the international community with what I call a multilateral moment. Now, multilateral moments arise when action is required on a particular issue, a problem that can't be solved by any single country. Uh, we've reached multilateral moments before. Uh, in some instances, the international community uh, has risen to the occasion, as in the deployment of coalition forces to East Timor to stop post-referendum violence, or the unanimous Security Council resolution in the aftermath of the September 11th attack uh, about self-defense um, uh, uh, for the United States. In other situations, such as Rwanda and Srebrenica, the multilateral moment passed with ignominious inaction. The most dramatic multilateral moments often call for Security Council action and the rapid deployment of armed forces to protect civilians. But others develop more slowly. Um, a multilateral moment that didn't call for Security Council action was the economic crisis of 2008 when the G20 was raised to the level of head of state and head of government in order to stave off and effectively work to stave off an even worse um, uh, economic catastrophe. Um, one could see that the effort to stem climate change or responding to possible pandemics might uh, also call for multilateral, might also create multilateral moments. Regarding Libya, the pair of Security Council resolutions, 1970 and 1973, are in, in many ways extraordinary developments in, uh, in response to a multilateral moment. Um, but before we get to them, though, I think we should recall how the Council reached uh, the point of adopting first resolution 1970 and then a few weeks later, 1973. You might remember that on February 22nd, with reports of the Gaddafi regime perpetrating significant attacks on civilians, the Council released a press statement, the lo uh, which is the lowest level of expression of the Council's views, which, among other things, called on the government of Libya to meet its responsibility to protect its civilians condemned the violence and use of force against civilians, and underscored the need for those responsible for the attacks to be held accountable. Now, on its face, the statement touched many important points, but it was clearly just words in the face of an ongoing crisis and an escalating crisis. Rising pressure, partly from publics aroused by the CNN effect of what was going on in Libya, uh, partly from motivated influential states, such as the UK and France, brought the Security Council back to the issue four days later to adopt unanimously Resolution 1970, which imposes targeted sanctions on, uh, on Libya, asset freeze, travel ban, and arms embargo on Gaddafi and his associates, and refers the potential crimes against humanity carried out by the regime to the International Criminal Court. The resolution was adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, but interestingly, and this is one of the things that I received calls about from the press, uh, citing Paragraph 41, which rules out military action. Um, and, uh, but requires all states to cooperate in its implementation. And the unanimous referral to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, is groundbreaking um, and could set a precedent for future action. And interestingly, um, of the permanent members of the Security Council, all of which, of course, voted for this, um, three of the five, uh, Russia, China, and the U.S., are not parties to the Rome Statute. Uh, uh, that is the, the, uh, the, 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 the treaty that, that created the... Uh, the International Criminal Court. So they're not, part, they're not members, uh, as it were, of the International Criminal Court. Now, by most accounts, the Security Council negotiations over the text of the resolution were difficult, with certain member states expressing concerns, especially about the ICC referral. A number of states had to swallow long-held misgivings about meddling in the internal affairs of another state. Uh, they're carried out the negotiations were carried out behind closed doors, so we're not exactly sure what positions were taken, but the fact that it took four days to reach agreement on the resolution, which is, by the way, lightning speed in Security Council terms, underscores that there wasn't an easy unanimity among the states, even though they all voted in favor. Now, despite the strength of that resolution, it was unlikely to result in an immediate halt to the violence, of course. I mean, it was imposition of sanctions and potential prosecution at, at, uh, at a later point. International organizations are really not set up to end violence rapidly, even though after each horror we assure ourselves that they will occur never again. The problem with rapid action through multilateral organizations such as the UN is that getting the agreement of member states is hard. It's made more difficult by the, by the fact that uh, 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 in the Security Council, veto-wielding permanent members have strongly divergent views 
about intervention in, uh, in internal affairs. Uh, the disagreement is over whether sovereign, sovereign borders should protect states from intervention, in effect throw up a wall that can't be permeated, and whether sovereignty is contingent on behavior, behavior of, of states toward their citizens, among other things. Uh, China and Russia, and many of the former colonized uh, states, uh, are wary of what they believe to be a, an easy Western willingness to intervene in the affairs of, of states. And states that, that very strongly believe in the responsibility to protect and in human rights um, uh, chafe at this, uh, at this blockage, this inability at times to intervene, or this resistance to it. The divide was even more apparent when the Security Council uh, voted, voted to adopt Resolution 1973. Five members, which is, which is the resolution that authorized military action to protect civilians. Five states vetoed the resolution. China, Brazil, Germany, India, and Russia made clear their unease with the intervention. The fragility of the coalition formed to carry out the operation was made apparent on its first day when Arab League Secretary General Amr Musa first condemned the military actions and then quickly walked back his condemnation. The Arab League endorsement of a no-fly zone a few days before the resolution was adopted provided the regional legitimacy that enabled France and the United Kingdom to push forward the resolution in the Security Council. The Libya example highlights, I believe, a number of characteristics of multilateral politics that frustrate both its practitioners and casual observers. And something I, 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 I say to people in Washington as, as I talk about it too, and I feel it's especially needed to say there, um, we Americans aren't unique in our frustration about multilateralism. Um, uh, many people seem to think, and I, I, I hear this often, that there's an American frustration with the slowness and, and difficulty of multilateral politics. And uh, since the, these other countries are pretty comfortable with it and, and, um, and, and uh, uh, are, are, are not unhappy with it. Um, after 12 years at the UN, I can, I can say, uh, uh, I think accurately and strongly, everybody's frustrated with multilateralism. Everybody is frustrated with how hard it is and with, with some of these uh, characteristics that I'm, that I'm going to discuss. Um, Except everybody also sees that for certain issues that, require, that, that defy, as I mentioned, unilateral solutions, there's really no option but to work together multilaterally. Um, now, as I start, I, I, I have to, to give a, a, a shout out uh, at the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, Gary Bass of this institution had an excellent piece in the Washington Post over the weekend, and I recommend this to all of you, that sets out very well some of the more general difficulties with humanitarian inter intervention and provides a useful historical perspective on the issue. And so um, uh, it, it's a great summing up. I, I recommend it. I'm going to focus a little bit more specifically on the multilateral aspects of it. Um, one of the first issues is that action can often require torturous negotiations, even in the face of imminent catastrophe. Getting sovereign states to agree on anything isn't easy, but reaching agreement on issues on which there's a fundamental disagreement, as, as with this divide over sovereignty, or significant domestic importance is, is extremely, extremely difficult. The divide over the meaning and, and power of sovereignty pervades Security Council debates. It's no surprise that the climate change uh, uh, accord stalled over a desire of mature economies to have countries cut their carbon emissions, and that of rising economies to continue to be able to increase their carbon consumption in order to fuel growth rates. The last G20 summit was not able to reach agreement on currency issues and trade balancing because of the gap between the US on the one side and China on the other on issues that directly affect both their domestic economies and thus their politics. Now on a side note, um, I believe that that we, and I mean the global we in this case, are still learning how to do multilateral politics. Nation states have had plenty of practice with the current form of bilateral and alliance diplomacy since the creation of the Westphalian state uh, nearly 400 years ago. We've been doing multilateral politics in this form since World War II, the end of World War II. And I believe that we, as an international community, are still learning how to do it and, uh, uh, and are working our, our way working with imperfect institutions in an extremely difficult uh, environment. And also, multilateral organizations often have on their agenda some of the most difficult issues on the international agenda, um, as in climate change, uh, trade rebalancing, uh, uh, Chinese currency issues, among other things. 
Um, having said that, though, I would say that a benefit, maybe even a, it may, maybe even a feature rather than a de design flaw in the system, is that the divides between and among states can make it harder for the system to move too fast in any particular direction. For example, if responsibility to protect gained full support, the pressure to act might overwhelm the global capacity to act. And so slow is not always bad, and disagreement can be useful. Um, but it can also hamstring uh, organizations and just show how slow and sclerotic these organizations can be. Second, multilateral negotiations by their nature can easily lead to the lowest, to lowest common denominator outcomes. No-fly zones, for example, are absolutely the lowest common denominator of multilateral military action. Resolution 1973 provides for much more than that, um, but does not go to the extent of explicitly supporting the Libyan rebel, rebels or endorsing the removal of the Gaddafi regime, uh, or putting boots on the ground, as, uh, and, and, which is a line that, that President Obama, among many others, have drawn. Which in many ways leads to the third point. All of the above often causes governments to overlook disagreements on interpreting resolutions and mandates to enable them to go forward. These disagreements are papered over only to arise once the action is underway. Uh, Amr Musa's disavowal, for example, was a particularly dramatic form of this, but it's clear that different coalition members have signed up for slightly different reasons in the Libya action and envision, envision somewhat different missions and mandates. In addition, in their national capacities, three leading members of the coalition, France, the UK, and the US, have all stated that they desire regime change in Libya. They make clear, though, that their actions within the coalition are constrained by the narrower mandate of Resolution 1973 to protect civilians. But it's precisely this sort of distinction that's part and parcel of multilateral diplomacy that drives some observers crazy. So they cannot legally or politically stretch the military mandate to bring about regime change and still hold the coalition together. But the military actions, coupled with sanctions and threats of prosecution in the International Criminal Court, could hasten the demise of the regime by peeling supporters away. This depends to a large extent on whether the ragtag rebels can become an effective fighting force. And they have not shown the capacity up to this point of taking territory and holding that territory in the face of Gaddafi's forces. Is this complicated? Absolutely. But welcome to this new world of transition that we're living in. Um, this could affect the stability of the coalition as the mission proceeds and lengthens, and the threat against civilians uh, uh, appears to recede. For example, if, if the threat against civilians does appear to recede, it's easy to imagine uh, some of the members of the council who uh, abstained in the initial vote calling the Security Council back into session and saying, well, is there really a need for this mission continuing? Let's revisit this and let's, uh, uh, let's think about wrapping this up. Um, at the same time, if we're still talking about this a year from now, I wonder what the coalition might look like, because I'm not sure that coalition members necessarily signed up for a longer term uh, uh, mission that, uh, that, that might settle into uh, 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 a degree of stasis if, if, uh, if a stalemate develops between the, the uh, Gaddafi regime and the, and the rebels. A fourth issue is the selectivity of intervention. And this is something I think that Gary Bass dealt with very well, too, but specifically on the, on the multilateral side. The two Libya resolutions are significant in their citing of the norm of the responsibility to protect. Now, to be sure, this isn't the first humanitarian intervention uh, authorized by the Security Council, but it is the first time that the responsibility to protect has been, has been cited as a basis. And so then we can ask, why Libya and not Cote d'Ivoire? Why not Syria? Why not Bahrain? Part of the answer is Bismarck's aphorism that politics is the art of the possible. It was possible to have um, an intervention in Libya. It would not be possible, at least not in, in the current circumstances, to have interventions in those other places. I'd set Cote d'Ivoire aside because I think that there was active and, and uh, up to a point effective multilateral activity as regards Cote d'Ivoire. Um, because of a unique set of circumstances, Gaddafi's isolation from the Arab world, a lack of great power vital interest, significant European interest in advocacy, to cite a few, action was possible in Libya that wouldn't be possible in other circumstances. In addition, though, it's fair to ask what this bodes for the responsibility to protect. And in thinking about that, it's, it's important to remember that the Security Council is not a court uh, 
that's governed by precedent. It's a political body, and politics doesn't always lend itself to, to consistency. Uh, it will be interesting to see where we go with the responsibility to protect, but it, in some ways we could imagine that this is a, um, a circumstance that enabled the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the doctrine, the norm to be, um, uh, uh, to, be, to be used for this resolution. We might not see another similar situation in the near term. Having said that, though, I think it will, it'll be hard to put this genie back in the bottle for those states that, that have their doubts about it. Fifth is the continued relevance and I think need for multilateral institutions to help us to do together what we can't or won't do alone. And I don't mean this in the sense of the soaring rhetoric of the preamble to the UN Charter, but rather I think of it in a much more pragmatic sense of using the best tools and means available to solve particular problems. It's multilateralism is one item, I mean for, for all states, not just for the US, is one item on a menu of policy options, useful in some instances, not necessarily so useful in other instances. No one was going to act unilaterally or in a small grouping on Libya. The Arab League was necessary for cover and the Security Council was necessary for legality and legitimacy. Whatever obituaries are often written for either the nation state or the multilateral system it supports, something always happens to show its relevance. The system might be creaky, unrepresentative in many aspects, inefficient and much of the time impenetrable and opaque to outsiders, but the international community is not going to recreate it and at times desperately needs it. But we'll continue to tweak it as in the rise of the G20, which was a, a, a very useful occurrence, or the reform of voting rights at the World Bank and IMF, or at some point in the, in the future, the possibility of Security Council reform. Which leads me to my sixth and final point. Increasingly, multilateral politics will be influenced by the rise of emerging powers. The current lineup of the Security Council is fascinating because it includes four, possibly five states that have pretensions to becoming permanent members. Brazil, Germany, India, South Africa, and maybe Nigeria. Their behavior on the Council will be interesting, as will that of an increasingly assertive China. As I mentioned previously, uh, of this group, only South Africa and Nigeria voted in favor of Resolution 1973 on Libya. Some observers suggest that they should only be granted membership to, the, to this exclusive club when they show that they're, as it were, ready for prime time and able to pick up the responsibilities of the great power mantle. Some go as far as to suggest that they receive support from us and others maybe to, to achieve that goal. I think that this begs the question, this, among other things, it begs the question um, of to what extent earlier great powers in this system, the US, uh, Europeans are held, out as, are held out as examples of this, truly acted with the selflessness and responsibility that is put forward now for the emerging powers to follow. But regardless of the answer to that question, the emerging powers or those that ultimately emerge among them will chart their own diverse paths to great power status. And multilateral bodies will, will probably become, could well become, sites of great power struggles and rivalries during this period. After the instability of their rise, the multilateral political landscape could look rather different than it does now. I think it was interesting and carefully considered that as military action in Libya was beginning, rather than staying in Washington and addressing uh, the nation from the White House, President Obama followed through on a planned visit to Brazil one of the most important of the emerging powers. Just a brief word on the implications of Libya for US policy and specifically on whether there's an Obama doctrine that's been established. In his speech at the National Defense University, President Obama set out the reasons for the intervention in Libya. He cited principles but made it clear that those principles would not necessarily be applied consistently case by case by case, you know, Libya first and so on. I think they, and I, I think those, those principles were a belief uh, a, a, a need to, for there to be an imminence of catastrophe, a need for a mandate from the Security Council for, as I mentioned, legality and legitimacy, a need for partners, especially regional partners, to share the burden of action and provide greater and more localized legitimacy. And a corollary, I suppose, would be the willingness of other states to take the lead when possible instead of the U.S. But he didn't, in my mind, put forward an Obama doctrine, and I believe that's a good thing. Given the complexity of the international landscape and the repeatedly, rapidly changing power structure, instability in the Middle East and North Africa, this is not really a time for doctrines, but rather a flexible pragmatism is necessary 
which, is, which pretty much captures how we'll need to deal with, in general, with multilateral cooperation for the foreseeable future. And uh, I think I'll stop at that point. And thank you very much. Answer questions. Are there questions? Yes. Thank you very much. Could you speak a little bit more about Security Council reform? Because, as I understand it, this is articulated in a general assembly discussion, and the countervailing pressures of different countries tend to cancel out any hope for some sort of solution emerging. And this is a debate that's been going on for years. So is there some kind of tipping point or a critical point where reform will suddenly happen? Or are we looking at more years of negotiation? I, I think we are looking at more years of negotiation. And there, and there are all sorts of um, uh, uh, pot potential blockages. I mean, if you go region by region, Brazil is, is if, if there were to be a Latin American candidate, Brazil is, is, is clearly that candidate. It's not a Spanish-speaking country, and a number of its smaller neighbors chafe at the idea that Brazil would, in effect, be their permanent representative on the Security Council. Um, uh, Africa, back and forth between Nigeria and South Africa, um, uh, whether there could be agreement on, um, among the many member states uh, uh, in Africa for that is, is, is an open question. Um, as regards India's potential as a permanent member, um, uh, it, would, it drives Pakistanis crazy to think of that, and it would cause them to mobilize allies to, to block it as best as possible. Um, China itself it, it would not necessarily be um, eager to have India as a, as a permanent member of the council. And, and then as we, as we move through, uh, through Asia and think about maybe Japan as a permanent member as well, um, that's, that's another country that, that, might, that might cause um, uh, potential uh, uh, rivals or, or, or spoilers in Asia to want to, to, to block their membership. And um, not surprisingly, Europe could well be the most complicated of all, where you've already got two non-great power um, members of the Security Council, the UK and France. Um, Germany is clearly the most powerful and significant member of the European Union, should there be a European Union seat? Would, 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 is, is it possible that two member states would be willing to give up uh, their permanent membership uh, on the council and veto? Um, uh, is, it, uh, uh, is, it, is it possible that other member states would agree to a third European country sitting on the council? Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue that's, that, that's fraught with all sorts of, of politics legislative politics in the, in the General Assembly among member states that's not unlike the legislative politics we see down in Washington that almost led to a shutdown of the government. You know, who, who moves first? Who takes what position? What bargains are you willing to, to make? Um, some of the potential um, uh, w or would-be permanent members of the council have, been, have, have said that they would be willing to take up their, um, their permanent positions without a veto uh, in order to, to sweeten the deal. Um, whether that might help, it's, it's hard to say. Whether the permanent members want to invite other members into their club is another matter. It was, it was fairly easy and, and, a, and a bit of a public relations coup for President Obama to promise to support India's membership on the, uh, on the uh, permanent membership on the Security Council when he visited uh, uh, New Delhi. But um, whether that's going to translate into much of anything is, uh, uh, is, uh, is unlikely in the short term. And he was notably less um, uh, uh, supportive of Brazil's potential permanent membership. We've got a long way to go, but you know, it, it's amazing how, how situations can change very quickly. So I wouldn't necessarily predict that, that and I, I wouldn't want to make any predictions, but, uh, but, think, but it could turn quickly. But from the way it looks now, uh, we're nowhere closer to uh, Security Council reform. Yes, yes, thank you for your remarks overall. Uh, just to pursue that one, uh, this one bit uh, a bit further, um, it, much has been written and said lately about Germany. Merkel blew it by the abstention. Are you able to speak to that at all? Um, I, I, I know less about the internal politics of of uh, of, 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 of Germany, and and, and 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 I and I know that there are fraught politics within the European Union um, on on this issue. Germany's abstention was, 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 was very interesting. And I, th I think when you put it together with, with the very hard line that Germany is taking on, on, on certain economic issues in the European Union, um, and the increasing weakness of, of the Merkel government, um, uh, I, I, I think that, that the, the, 
the extremely powerful Germany that dominated the European Union of a, um, a couple of years ago uh, uh, seems not to uh, it seems not to be uh, uh, in that position any longer. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you. Um, I just you had begun by talking about the multilateral moment, and it seemed like it was very much fact based and in, in, in the situation going on, but then it went toward uh, the selectivity. Uh, of situations and, and understanding the politics, but the, um, in the selective use of uh, responsibility to protect and wondering, you know, Cote d'Ivoire was one element, but there was already a peacekeeping force there, the peacekeeping force next door, you know, imagining uh, uh, the UN to mobilize. So is it, can you talk about a little bit more, is it troubling that this selective use and thinking of, selective use of responsibility to protect, protect thinking of it in terms of understanding the Syria, but there's also how would it work with China uh, doing something? How would it work in terms of the U.S. if we did another Guantanamo? You know, but may, maybe I spent too long at the U.N. and so I, I'm less bothered by this than uh, than, than others are, and, and that maybe it says more about me than anything else. But um, I think it's very clear. You know, if 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 it were to be applied to any of the permanent members, you can easily imagine them just vetoing it, and that's it. Um, you know, there, there's kind of a uh, a don't go there sense um, in uh, that that each me permanent member of the council has for um, I'd say I'd say for the for the two Europeans it's a little different but China Russia U S that we have for our for the for the areas that we consider to be vital interests and don't even think about it you know it, it's uh, Russia in its um, uh, in its near abroad um, uh, China as as regards um, certain issues of self determination. Um, and uh, um, and uh, and the U.S. is actually the most uh, uh, frequent uh, practitioner of the use of the veto, and it's largely over um, resolutions uh, relating to Israel. Um, uh, so uh, so no, it, it's it's so it's easy to imagine that for for, for something that, that 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 each cares about deeply, that considers a vital interest, it's it's a no go area. Um, but but the selectivity. You know, I, I, I'm 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 a, I'm a lawyer by training, and 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 became a lawyer in this uh, in this very precedent-based system. But I, I I understand the 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 politics of the Security Council and how it's motivated by that. So I I, I feel less concerned about um, the the selectivity, and and actually it, my, my reckoning of multilateral moments, it's 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 not a matter of the 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 multilateral moment arriving and then the international community living up to it sometimes it do, sometimes it does sometimes it doesn't um, there might be instances where um, there could well be specific blockages among member states you know China was was not eager to have um, uh, uh, Sudan further isolated um, over over a range of issues uh, um, presumed by many in part because of its uh, its 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 relationship to Sudan as an oil producer. Um, it's uh, uh, it, it's 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 partly the nature of the business, and and as I said, e even though we're not necessarily going to see a consistent application, at least an early consistent application of the responsibility to protect, those countries that have their questions about intervention are going to have a hard time putting that genie back in the bottle. It's been done now. It's been said, um, uh, and uh, uh, it it it. I think we will see it again in the future, but we will not see it consistently applied in the future. Yes, please. Um, I also have a question regarding RTP. And um, well, the definition of RTP is, let's say, debatable for some countries. And uh, when you are negotiating at the table of uh, the United Nations, um, some country delegates cannot just um, agree if the definition is not clear enough. And but whereas um, at the, um, how can I say, on the field, um, those who are um, practitioners, those who are working on the field are facing this pressing um, situation. And there is a kind of um, distinct difference in terms of terms um, at the um, UN negotiation table and um, on the field. And um, regarding this definition issue, um, there, there is also a con kind of um, concept, other concept like human security, which is, which is causing similar problem, and um, do you have any idea regarding this um, negotiation issue and the clearing um, definition um, in terms of this post regarding this in, in the context of post-conflict? 
it's 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 interesting that the um, the outcome document from the Millennium Summit that 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 put responsibility to protect uh, uh, squarely on the UN agenda and then was cited in a General Assembly resolution really doesn't define effectively responsibility to protect. Um, it's not an unusual issue in multilateral bodies to to support a concept and then allow that concept to be defined by um, by in, in different ways. Um, I don't know how I, I, I was, was once involved in uh, uh, United Nations responses to terrorism, and there has been on the table for years and years and years a resolution to define terrorism, and it is impossible to get agreement on that. Um, uh, I, 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 think, I think that um, if, if I understand your, 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 your question correctly, it's, it's, it's the, the gulf between or the gap between how it might be discussed at the at the higher levels around the Security Council and what's happening on the ground. Um, I mean, to, th this, as 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 a number of people have said, and as I pointed out earlier, this humanitarian intervention, for example, um, uh, under the responsibility to protect, was far from the first humanitarian intervention that the Security Council has um, uh, has supported, even before there was a concept of the responsibility to protect. Um, it will um, uh, uh, it, the, the norm will be honored in 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 the breach at times or in fits and starts at other times, um, but uh, and and actors on the ground and especially even more importantly than the actors on the ground, the people who are subject to um, uh, the civilians who are subject to attacks uh, by by governments by. Um, uh, by non-state actors who are not protected by their by their governments, um, will continue to fall victim to that. Um, it's uh, it's it's uh, un until there is general agreement on the norm, it's going to be very very difficult to to to, to square the, the the reality on the ground with the problems uh, with the, and the problems on the ground with the with the debate at. Um, at higher levels or in capitals, I mean, and it almost it goes back to this question. I think it relates to the question of selectivity um, and consistency. Um, we are a long way off from um, from consistent uh, um, application. And as I also said, I'm not so sure we would want necessarily want um, you know be careful what you wish for. The consistent application of the responsibility to protect. Could be uh, very, very difficult uh, um, uh, on any number of levels, and so this debate, yes, people suffer in the in the interim, but it's important for the international community to work this out so that then, um, at a certain point in the distant future, we can, uh, or hope, I hope, not too distant future, um, have a, a, a greater understanding of when and how and where it can be applied. Yes. Um, I don't know how closely you've been following um, the stuff in Cote d'Ivoire, but I was wondering if you had any initial assessment of how the cooperation has gone between French troops and or France and the UN yeah. in that case, and, and then with other Western powers and what that says about um, multilateral coordination. Well, Cote d'Ivoire, I think, is a really interesting case, um, uh, in, in, in part because you know, so, some have looked at the events in Libya and said, well, why not Cote d'Ivoire? Without understanding that the international community has been involved in Cote d'Ivoire for many, many years. There's a peacekeeping mission on the ground, as, 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 as you pointed out, um, uh, and French troops on the ground in an agreement, a written agreement between the United, Nation and the Fr United Nations and the French troops about the deployment of those troops, which has been, as we see now, enormously helpful for the UN, um, a mandate for the UN peacekeepers, as well as for the French troops, to protect civilians in their mission areas, which are fairly broad, um, which they've now brought into uh, to play um, uh, in um, in attacks on, um, uh, on on forces of Laurent Gbagbo that have been threatening civilians. Um, there's also been an enormous degree of a relative degree. Of international unity, there have been some uh, uh, both on the regional, the sub-regional, regional, and international basis. The, yes, there's been no Security Council resolution, um, but uh, uh, regarding the uh, um, uh, uh, anything like the the sanctions applied in Libya, 
Um, but there have been sanctions applied against Bagbo. Um, uh, the United Nations was very clear that it, it, uh, it believed that Alassane Ouattara was the winner of the presidential election. Um, the, uh, the economic community of West African states was very clear about that as well. And the African Union with South Africa and Angola as kind of defectors wavering. And now South Africa is very much on board with, you know, maybe late in the game, but with, with, uh, with Bagbo's removal and stepping aside for Ouattara. Um, the Secretary General traveled to Addis Ababa to the annual meeting of the, uh, of the African Union, and together, they, they made, this was three months ago, made it very clear. Bagbo is illegitimate, Ouattara is, is legitimate. Um, so it, it's, it's um, and I, I remember when that, that was happening, and this is well before anything took off in Libya or anywhere else in the Middle East, that thinking that this is going to be a war of attrition, that this is not, once again, you know, I, my colleagues are probably sick of me saying this, but multilateralism is slow and hard, and this was going to be slow and hard. Um, sanctions were applied, isolation, um, uh, uh, degree of unanimity, pressure from other African heads of state for, Watar, for, for, for Bagbo to step down. Um, uh, and and I, I, I kind of thought it would take some time. I think during that time, as Bagbo was weakened, Watar built up his, built up his forces. I, you know, this is not a direct correlation between the international action and, and the and the, and the success of, of Ouattara's forces. But um, the international community was pretty united on this. This is another issue that France took a lead on. Uh, the United States was very clear too, but, but was not willing or it was not necessary for it to take, uh, to play a leading, a leading role. And, and, and it didn't. Um, I, I think Cote d'Ivoire is an interesting case on a, on a number of different levels and, uh, um, and hasn't, been ignored by the international community in the way um, that has been depicted over recent weeks. Um, and, and it seems to be, and, and, and this is one thing I, you know, far from having expertise on, but it seems as though there was, um, uh, in answer to your specific question, effective, very effective cooperation between the French forces and the UN. You know, I, I uh, uh, would probably need one of my military colleagues to tell me exactly how well it worked. But it, it seemed as though there was very good communication um, uh, and, um, uh, and acting in, in keeping with the, with the written agreement that exists between the French and the UN on this issue. Yes. I just wondered, do you know what exactly the difference was between like Libya and Cote d'Ivoire? Because it seems like, from what you're saying, that there was a lot of unanimity regarding whether or not you know we thought Bagbo should go in Cote d'Ivoire. There wasn't a lot of people who didn't think he should. Where it was sort of disobeying international norms with elections, that kind of stuff. Um, it was ongoing, and it was sort of obvious to everyone. Why do you think? Um, like from your experience, why do you think Libya caught everyone's attention? Was it oil? Was it you know, its location, proximity to Europe, you know, was it the threat of sort of military force? I mean, arguably, you could say more was going on in Cote d'Ivoire um, with a greater chance of the, I mean, we at least know, or at least we believe that there is an elected representative government that could take over. So I was just sort of wondering, like, what are people talking about over at the UN? It seems kind of odd. Well, I, I think, I think what, once again, there, there is a sense that um, there has been action on Cote d'Ivoire, and there are... Um, uh, there was a peacekeeping force and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a French military group there as well. And, and I'm, I'm and, and I'm not saying that, that I definitely don't want to say that that um, Cote d'Ivoire has been handled as well as it could have been handled. And so we can, you know, we don't need to to to, to look back at that and or that that um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire was handled in a way commensurate with the way that Libya was handled. Uh, definitely don't want to say that. Um, but but I, I, th I think that part of the, um, uh, uh, the belief was that Cote d'Ivoire was being handled, um, that these things take time, um, that, 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 that there were reports of civilians, of, 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 of atrocities against civilians um, that could, could well have been dealt with uh, more effectively by the peacekeeping force. Um, uh, and, and, and by the French, you know, they swung into action a, 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 a little late. Um, Bagbo actually did a very good job of, of, of making it very difficult for the peacekeeping operation to, uh, to operate uh, 
but not in such a way that would cause them to pull out the big guns to, 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 uh, uh, to act. Um, no, I, I, I think that Sub-Saharan Africa you know, is, is always a stepchild. Uh, 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 and as, as someone who spent much of his early career working on Sub-Saharan Africa, you know, I, I, uh, um, I feel very, very strongly about that and, and, and regret it very much. I, I think that, that the events in Libya were, um, uh, you know, for one, for one thing, the, it's, it, it sounds facile, but, I, but, I, but I, I, I think that where the media is plays a major role in this. Um, there were hundreds of journalists in Egypt. And then Egypt was kind of resolved, and they were next door, and Libya blows up. And I, I mean, I, I know this because a number of my friends were in this situation. They then, then they moved to Libya and saw what was happening there. You know, many of them just drove across the border from Egypt and saw what was happening there and had it on our televisions and had it in, in our newspapers and on radio um, and shocked the world's conscience. Um, I would say also, though, two leaders, really one in particular, um, Nicolas Sarkozy took this on as a... Um, as, as, a, as a, um, uh, a, a, a very important um, uh, uh, priority and, and, um, uh, and to a lesser extent uh, Cameron in the UK and um, further in, increased the, the attention. Um, the, uh, uh, no one supported uh, Gaddafi. Uh, well, I, should say, I shouldn't say that. He's got lots of friends in the African Union for, uh, for financial reasons. Um, but otherwise, not, not popular, and especially not popular in the Arab world. Um, uh, so there was an Arab willingness to criticize very early on, um, uh, leading up to that, um, that, that, that the, uh, their famous support for, uh, for a no-fly zone. So in some ways, you know, and I, I kind of don't like this phrase, but there was a bit of a perfect storm for Libya. You know, journalists being, being proximate, being, getting access, seeing terrible things that were happening, um, uh, uh, lack of support in the region, um, uh, it being part of this general Arab Spring um, that that had captured the world's attention, um, and all of these things led to the uh, uh, the strong desire for, for for action, and I think made it easier uh, for actions like that to be taken um, as regards Libya. Uh, but I, I think that you know what what we need and what the UN needs is. And I think I think I think that individual countries too is to, to. Once the dust clears, at least to a certain extent, take to to take a step back and, and think about how these pieces fit together, and how um, uh, how they performed uh, during this period. Um, it might be vain to uh, to uh, to hope that that would occur. Um, at least in our program, we're going to be studying it very closely and doing some writing about it in the future. Yes. Sir. Are you aware that as of 3 p.m. when I heard it, Bagpo's redoubt was stormed and he's been arrested? Right. So it's I understand. <laughs> so I understand. Yeah, yes. yeah. And and, and that, that that's a, that it, it, it's, it appears, and I you know, information is hard to come by, but it appears as though there's a um, one of these classic kind of winks, multilateral winks and nods where. Um, he was probably arrested by French troops, but the French are saying that, no, he was arrested by Alassane Ouattara's forces, um, uh, just to add to Ouattara's legitimacy there. But no, I, that, that's, what I, that's what I understand, too. Um, I, I think in both Libya and, um, and Cote d'Ivoire, we're in for long periods of international involvement. Um, and I think uh, Cote d'Ivoire is going to be a ward of the international community for some time to, to come. But at least uh, it, it appears as though this chapter is over. Yes. Yeah. No. I want to ask you a kind of a more theoretical, conceptual question about multilateralism and international institutions. Um, so, you know, as you discussed, there's this discussion or negotiation to kind of um, expand the permanent membership of the Security Council. And this is kind of reflective of a general tension in international organizations in that to kind of give their activities legitimacy, there needs to be greater representation. <laughs> So is that when they make decisions, those decisions will be seen as legitimate and they'll be brought by in. But at the same time, <clears throat> you talk about the frustration of multilateral institutions. 
and that they can be inefficient, ineffective, they can dilly dally, then negotiation failures and get more difficult. So, so how do you think about this kind of fundamental trade off between expanding the representation of more countries in the world in international organizations and the need to even to have multilateralism to have efficiency agreement and kind of will to act uh, by, by the major players? Um, it's a really good question because I, it, it's, it's easy to imagine that the expansion of the Security Council will lead to greater inefficiencies in the Council, not lesser inefficiencies. The expansion of the permanent membership which might need to go along with the expansion of the non-permanent membership just to, to ensure a balance. Um, uh, and so all of the problems that, that we see, you know, exactly, negotiation, failure, blockages, it's easier to be a spoiler sometimes than to be, than to be active, um, could, could occur even more. The other thing too, you know, as, as, as much as the US um, is willing to support India's membership as a, as a permanent member of the council, um, I hope they're not counting on India voting with the U.S. very often. Um, uh, you know, it has very strong views and has been a leader of, um, of the group of 77, a group of developing countries, in, in opposing intervention, um, among other things, and opposing what they consider to be the meddling in the internal affairs um, of other states. I mean, to the extent that, just to give you an example, India led the charge against the expansion of the Department of Political Affairs and the Secretariat of the UN. Now, this is the department that kind of watches the world and advises the Secretary General in political terms. Um, it's one thing to support the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. They need to be big. They put missions in the field. Um, India and a number of partner states, and actually this is one issue that they were in common cause with Pakistan on, wondered, do we really want to have desk, more desk officers looking at India, looking at, looking at Pakistan, looking at other countries? No. You don't get to expand. Um, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a real problem. I, I, th I think it's a problem in, um, if, if we look at a snapshot, we see it as, as a potentially massive problem. I, I, I think that it's, it's, um, it's an issue in development. Um, I think both India and China, for example, are finding it harder and harder to, to be great powers and at the same time retain their membership in the group of 77 and their leadership of the group of 77, and they're finding that their interests are diverging as much as they might not want it to seem that way. Um, I, 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 think, I think here, you know, we're looking at, at, at more difficulty in the short run as a trade-off for more legitimacy in the longer run, um, and hoping that the, the, the Security Council, as it settles into a new um, um, uh, 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 grouping of members, will settle into a modus vivendi that enables them to work effectively together. Um, but, but yeah, you know, you, you, one could imagine that the early years could be fairly rocky years, in part because it, just, just as you kind of game through ways it might happen, it's easier to imagine it happening all at once with a package deal rather than, okay, India gets on a few years past. Okay, Brazil gets on a few years past. No, Germany doesn't get on and so on. You probably imagine that a package might be the likeliest way for this to happen. And so that means a, you know, a major change in the working of the Security Council um, uh, uh, for, you know, all at once. Yeah. And inefficient multilateralism will just lead to more unilateralism, it which is... Could well, could well. Or, or inaction on issues like Libya or Rwanda. Um, I mean, you know, it was inefficient um, uh, uh, multilateralism. Well, it actually did lead to unilateralism, the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Uh, liberated Rwanda and stopped the genocide uh, with support from Uganda. Exactly. So it, it might it might lead to, uh, uh, to 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 more of that or just inaction in the case of prostrate countries that don't really have any friends, or or rebel forces waiting to to act or whatever. Um, uh, in the case of of Libya, um, you know, can imagine at least in the short run, um, uh, Gaddafi victory if not if not long term stability. Um, you know, it, it's 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 the nature of the beast in many ways, and yeah, like I said, maybe in you know a year to ten years, I can come back and talk about some smart solutions. But um, uh, but I I, th I think we need to understand where we are and to understand uh, uh, clearly, even even those of us who who believe that multilateralism is important, um, how it works, in order to think about how to make it more effective. I think we have time for about one more question.
guess I'll, I'll kind of say, I mean, your talk was smarter multilateralism. So, and you kind of Oops. talked about how multilateralism has or has not worked. Do you have anything to say about what would be smarter multilateralism or whether or not multilateralism is smarter in the long run yeah. at all? Um, I mean, what, one, one thing I, I would say is we have little choice in a way. And if, and if you think about the way states interact, it's, it's um, the resort to multilateralism is, is, um, has become a, a, a fundamental method of state interaction. I mean, you look at, I, I think the best example is, um, is Asia. Um, where you know you, you talk to individual policymakers in Thailand, Indonesia, wherever, and they'll say, uh, "Yeah, you know, really frustrated with multilateralism." And then they'll say, "You know, but it's really important that we're setting up this new multilateral forum, the East Asian Summit, Security Forum, and um, uh, you know, kind of as a springboard from ASEAN, which which has blossomed into creating all sorts of ways of interacting, um, because uh, it's necessary. It's hard. It's necessary. You know, it's frustrating. It's necessary." Um, having said that, though, uh, and this might be a bit, um, uh, um, I don't know, it might be a bit of a contrarian here. I, I, I think in the longer run, um, the creation of the G20 will be an interesting example of smarter multilateralism. It's a, it's a body that, that was created absolutely out of need. You know, the G8 realized that, that the, the international economy is tanking. Um, we don't have the power players, all the power players at the table. Um, we need to get them around the table. And oh, we've had this G20 that's been meeting for about 10 years at the, at the finance minister level only. Um, and actually, th this was an innovation in part of the Bush administration. Let's bring them together. Um, it's a messy group. It's not, it's not a group that's necessarily entirely logical. It's not the 20 biggest economies. But together, they account for what, something like 97% of the world economy. Um, they have a, an enormously diverse set of views um, uh, of, of, of methods of governance. Um, I've got friends who, uh, who, uh, who spent a lot of time working on G8 issues and how cozy it was, you know, a group of, of, of mostly North Atlantic democracies uh, um, you know, meeting together to work things out. And this is not that by a long shot. Um, uh, but it, it's, 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 it's also a body that's not necessarily um, uh, uh, stuck in or, or, or um, uh, tied to um, a bureaucracy. In effect, it gives instructions, and those instructions have been carried out by the World Bank and the IMF most, most specifically. Um, it's, um, it's an interesting approach. Um, a, lo a lot of people are writing its obituary now since the, since the Seoul Summit was... Um, I, I think, I think it's, its lack of success in Seoul was overestimated, but the Obama administration made a big play and did not succeed in that big play there. Um, and, and, and the attempt to, 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 to get the other members of the G20 to put pressure on China to devalue its currency and, and pressure on China and Germany and others to balance trade fell flat. Um, but once again, I, 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 think, I think we can't look at snapshots. I think, I think we need to look at the long term. You know, we, we're, we're a bit on a roller coaster, a market clearing curve as far as the G20. You know, 2008, it's great. 2010, it's a disaster. You know, let, let's, let's, let's see over time whether the members of the G20 can find a way of working together and, um, and, and whether it can be an effective alternative way of, of doing multilateralism. And it, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's especially interesting, given that we are um, dealing with uh, um, a number of the ma many of the major institutions are, were created in the post-World War II environment and haven't changed dramatically since then and are, and are, and are creaky now. And we're seeing the creaks uh, uh, and hearing those creaks. And the G20 is, is in effect, a, um, uh, you use kind of a slogan, a 21st century multilateral institution and let's let's see what happens with it but i think that's that's one one potential avenue of smart multi for smart multilateralism i also think in general asean bears watching because it's 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 expanding contracting ways of bringing co countries together is a, is is i i think a very interesting example of multilateralism too i mean if 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 you um, it, it's it seems to be could well be 
need to see the evidence of this, somewhat easier on the economic front um, uh, and trade front to do this, although WTO shows the tr how, how hard trade is but uh, in the Doha round. But um, uh, it'll be interesting to, to see and then what, whatever, what lessons can be learned by the UN and the Security Council and the, the peace and security field as well. Terrific. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all very much.